So for those who haven't been with us on Sunday nights, uh, you probably know, but just as a reminder, Jesus has just died on the cross. This is where we are in the Gospel of Matthew. And now we are in this period between the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ where He is buried. Um, we have, first of all, it says in, in verse 55, And many women who followed Jesus ministered to Him. That is, they're ministering to His body. Among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and also the mother of Zebedee's sons. That's Salome. Or Salome, if you remember, we saw her once before. And then we're introduced to Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, Luke tells us in his gospel that uh, Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the council of the Jewish leaders. Uh, but he did not consent to what uh, they had done to Jesus. We also, as we compare the other gospel accounts in this portion... Uh, we also have Nicodemus. Now, if you remember Nicodemus, that's the Pharisee who came to Jesus by night and uh, was told by Jesus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. So, uh, both of these Pharisees had become uh, disciples of Jesus. And Joseph takes the body of Jesus and, and we see that he gives him a proper burial in his own tomb. And uh, he rolls the stone over the entrance. Now the chief priests and the Pharisees made the request to Pilate for the guard uh, because they feared greatly what Jesus had said. Uh, Jesus had told them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again. Jesus had said that. This uh, confused them and it had upset them. This was one of the accusations made against Jesus at his trial when he was there before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders. Uh, and they were trying to find fault in him so that they could give him to be crucified. One of the false witnesses came forward and said, This man said he is going to destroy the temple and raise it again. But we know that Jesus was talking about the temple of his body. His body was going to be restored. It was going to be destroyed, but in three days he would rise again. And so the Jews that had brought Jesus to be executed feared these words and feared what would happen uh, to the Jewish community if they began to think uh, Jesus did indeed rise from the dead as he had said. Now, uh, they did not believe he would rise, but they did believe, as we read here, that it was a possibility uh, that the disciples of Jesus would be involved in some kind of conspiracy uh, to steal the body and hide it and thus make everyone in Jerusalem think uh, that Jesus did rise from the dead. So they want Pilate, we see them going to Pontius Pilate, the governor, to place a watch to guard the tomb around the clock. And it says there uh, that they, they go to Pilate and they ask him to place a, a, a guard to watch the tomb and to, and to make it as secure as possible. And so he grants their request by saying, and this is what I want to focus on, these words, uh, make it as secure as you can. And that was what they were doing with sealing that tomb and guarding that tomb, making it as secure as they could. So we have a stone over the tomb. We have soldiers guarding the tomb. Now it says here a guard, uh, and this is not, I, I do not believe to be interpreted as a single guard, but as uh, some say a guard could have been two, some say it could have been 16 soldiers. We don't I, it, could have, it was definitely at least a couple of men guarding the, uh, the tomb. And what we do know for sure is that the Roman soldiers were very highly trained men. And also, we know that to fall asleep while you're on guard duty at that, in that time um, could cost them their careers. It could, could even cost them 
of their lives. Remember, Pilate himself, as the governor of Judea, was afraid of what would happen to him if things got out of control in Jerusalem. He saw an uprising coming if he did not consent and allow them to put Jesus to death. So there were certainly consequences for the Roman if they failed in their duty to uh, the nation and, and their duty as soldiers and uh, government officials. Um, so the idea that the disciples could sneak past the guards, roll the stone away, steal the body of Jesus without getting noticed is really an impossibility. So we can say that they did make the tomb as secure as they could. That they did. They did make it as secure as they could, but it's not going to stop God from rolling the stone away and raising Jesus from the dead. Now, <clears throat> Satan and the world system are doing everything they can to make sure that the church and the gospel fails. They have, uh, throughout the course of church history and the history of the people of God, persecuted the church violently at times. Today they are trying to make a more stealthy approach, at least here in the West, uh, by changing the way that our children uh, think. Uh, they believe if they can train our children to think with a secular mindset, then church attendance will, over time, decline so much that churches will be forced to close their doors. And we see a lot of that happening today. They, they introduce laws that restrict the Christian influence on society. We see that happening today. They infiltrate the education system. Uh, they infiltrate the universities. Did you know that Harvard University and Yale University uh, were once reformed seminaries? And now look at them. They're bastions of uh, the non-biblical worldview. We see that happening today in the West. And we see uh, still today fierce persecutions, physical persecutions in other areas of the world. We see them doing everything they can to convince the next generation uh, in the United States and in Europe, especially that God doesn't exist. And if God does exist... He's not the God that Christianity has taught for 2,000 years. He's some other God. He's, he's a God that uh, can be reached through many different paths. He's a God who uh, loves everyone unconditionally. They've given birth, birth to many false religions and false concepts of God. And they've given birth to false concepts of Jesus that... Now, those who don't already know Christ are easily being deceived by today. They are full steam ahead in their attack on the true God. Full steam ahead on their attack of His people. They've been, uh, the devil and the world system have been doing this uh, since very early on in human history. But the, the thing is, uh, despite all of the attacks uh, that are upon the church of Christ that it has suffered, despite all of that, the church is still there, is still thriving in some areas of the world right now. We may not be seeing growth here in the United States of America, but in Asia and Africa right now, the church is growing leaps and bounds. Now, in Matthew 19, Jesus made a prophecy uh, that He would build His church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Now, this is something that God has not merely just said, but it is something that He has decreed. And this decree will stand no matter how fierce the opposition may be. The church was born. The church grows. The church thrives on the very same power that raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. The day of Pentecost. We read about that. And it's coming up, that season of Pentecost there in June. Uh, the day when the Holy Spirit came upon the church. You know, that day of Pentecost, it serves as a clear reminder that the church is alive because the Holy Spirit has given her life. The church is a living organism that operates solely on the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. Not only is, are we as believers made alive by the Holy Spirit, uh, whenever we are saved by God's grace. But the church as a whole is empowered by the Holy Spirit 
If she's going to do anything, if the church is going to do anything profitable to God's glory, anything profitable to the salvation of souls, the church needs the life of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are so-called churches out there that exist that are dead and void of any operation of the Holy Spirit. There are those out there, there are churches out there who quench the Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit isn't quenched in a church, there's vigorous life there. There's also, when when the Holy Spirit isn't quenched in the life of the Christian, there's vigorous life there as well. As their best efforts could not stop Jesus from rising from the dead, so they cannot stop God from advancing the gospel and saving souls. Nor can the church be stopped. The scriptures are clear about the fact that our Lord Jesus' crucifixion and His resurrection were all part of God's predestined plan. And He used those who thought they were putting a stop to Jesus. And he used these people's very attempts to stop Jesus to accomplish His plan to conquer all His enemies. You listen, when God has purpose to accomplish something, brothers and sisters, He accomplishes it. And none can stand in His way nor thwart His plan. You know, when the Jews were attempting to silence those in the early church who were preaching Christ in Jerusalem, uh, we hear the words of a very wise man named uh, Gamaliel. Uh, He's actually the one who trained the Apostle Paul as well, but he said this about the, the work of the gospel spreading in Jerusalem. Of course, the Jews did not want this to happen. They were trying to stop this. But he said, if this plan or this work is of men will come to nothing. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. And here we are 2,000 years later, and people's lives are still being touched. People's lives are still being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we have many problems to deal with. We talked about many of the physical struggles this morning in our prayer requests. But we also have spiritual problems that are far worse in those physical struggles. As fallen human beings born into this world, we have bondage to sin. We're born into that bondage. We're born into condemnation. Perhaps today you, you're under the condemnation of sin right now. You're, you, you're under the guilt of sin. Perhaps you're struggling with worry and anxiety. Perhaps you're even, you know, facing a a season of of pain, physical pain, spiritual pain, emotional pain, or perhaps you're dealing with grief right now. But you you must realize that these things cannot overcome the power of Christ in the life of the believer. All of these are common to the human experience. And as I said, there are consequences of being descendants of Adam and Eve who sinned and brought the curse on humanity. But the power of Christ in our life brings freedom from the bondage of sin. The power of Christ in our life brings freedom from the condemnation and the guilt of sin. And the power of Christ can give us His peace to overcome worry and anxiety. He can give us even the grace to endure pain and to deal with grief. And it's, it's not that the believer doesn't have to deal with unpleasant things. It's not that the believer doesn't have to deal uh, with difficult things after following Christ. You know, but the difference is between the Christian and the unbeliever is that the Lord helps us to bear our burdens. Now, my favorite verse, my life verse, is in Matthew chapter 11. And I've, I've said this before. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. We have this promise from Christ that He's going to help us carry our burdens. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden it's like that yoke that used to attach, attach to, the, to the mule or the ox to, to, to bear the load of whatever it is they were doing. You know, Jesus says, 
Come and, 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 and attach yourself into my yoke that you may be able to bear your burdens. <clears throat> you know, we need to think about Christ's crucifixion every day. We need to think about the resurrection of Christ every day. But I think we also need to remember Christ's burial every day. You know, it's interesting when you read 1 Corinthians 15 that, you know, when Paul is telling us the, the, the gospel in a nutshell, he mentions Christ dying for our sins. He, he mentions um, the resurrection of Christ, that He was raised from the dead on the third day. But, you know, that, that He also mentions the burial of Christ in there. <clears throat> for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose from the dead according to the Scriptures. So apparently that's uh, an important part of what we are to meditate upon, what we are to believe, and I believe that a daily reminder of the, secu the security of the tomb, Christ's burial, remembering how secure they had made that tomb, and knowing that as secure as they had made that tomb, it did not stop the Lord from walking out of the grave. Folks, that should encourage us daily that whatever difficulties that we're facing, no matter how impossible they may seem to us, we serve one who is able to help us come out on the other side victorious. Now what do we read there in Romans 8? We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Now, of course the health and the wealth and the prosperity preachers, and you'll prob you've probably heard them on TV, you know, and, and they'll say that um, these are the five uh, secrets so that you can have your best life now, and if you're experiencing any uh, pain or difficulty, then that's not God's will for your life. Well, we know that that is just simply a, a, a distortion of the Christian life. Uh, that's not what we mean by living in victory. Because you and I are going to experience pain, we're going to experience difficulty, uh, but these things must not be looked at as impossible situations. And that's the key. They, we're going to experience pain. We're going to experience difficulty. But we should not be looking at these things as impossible situations as believers. They should be viewed instead as opportunities for us to witness God's providence. As opportunities for us to uh, experience the help of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You know, difficulty and pain... Uh, are things that God actually allows in our lives to shape us and to strengthen us. And, and that's the point. God has a purpose for allowing these things. They're not just happening to us because uh, God is angry with us. No, they are shaping us and molding us as Christians to be more like our Lord. You know, others, they may look at difficulties and pain as a reason to give up. You know, unfortunately, you know, we have people in our world today, as we were reminded in, in church this morning, that commit suicide for whatever reason. Because they've, they have gotten to the place where they've given up hope. Uh, they cannot cope with the difficulties of life. They cannot cope with the pains of life, many of them. And others may look at, at these things as reasons to just simply give up. But we need to be reminded, as those who believe in God and believe that we have a purpose for our existence, we need to be reminded that God is able to use even the negative experiences of our lives in this present evil world to strengthen us, to make us uh, stronger human beings, stronger Christians, stronger disciples of Christ. you've never come to the place where you have given up on trying to solve your sin problem on your own, you must do so if you desire a true relationship with Jesus Christ. You must realize you do have a sin problem. We all certainly do. And it doesn't take very long to look at your life in comparison to, for instance, the Ten Commandments and realize that you fall short and you've sinned in thought, word, and deed. 
But you must give up on trying to solve the sin problem on your own if you're going to have a true relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to look to Him and Him alone as the solution to your sin problem. If you've never come to the place where you have given up on trying to get through hardship and pain in your own strength. Many people face these hardships and, and, and they, they face the difficulties of life and they try to face it in their own strength. And if that sounds like you, then you've been carrying unnecessary burdens for far too long. Peter tells us there, cast all your cares upon the Lord for He cares for you. Paul tells us, he says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. These are the kinds of promises that we have in the Word of God. We're not to be carrying our burdens alone. Now, sometimes it is the will of God that we face what seems like to us impossible situations. Whether that be physical challenges, health challenges, emotional problems, spiritual struggles. You've got this one sin in your life you just cannot overcome. And you keep falling and you keep trying to overcome. It just seems like you just can't make progress. Perhaps you say, well... I'm skeptical about Christ and I, I, I want to know, I want to be saved, but I don't feel like, I, I, I feel very distant from God. Maybe you're just dealing with, with uh, spiritual struggles and only you know what they are. But what we, what we must keep in mind is that God is a God who is very active in the creation. He's very active in the lives of His children. He's not the great clockmaker who who designed the clock and wound the clock up and then stepped back and let things run their course. No, that is not the God of the Scriptures. God is a God who is very active in creation. He's very active in the lives of His children. He's there with us so that we never have to face these difficulties and these hardships alone, these impossible situations to us. With men, many times these things are impossible. But we have to remember, Jesus said, that with God all things are possible. We are weak, but God is not. You know, man could not get out of a sealed tomb. But the God-man could get out of the sealed tomb. And over the course of your Christian life, you're going to see uh, at times that God does indeed make a way when there's no feasible way, humanly speaking, to be seen. Maybe you've experienced that. God made a way when you saw no way, humanly speaking, but somehow He made a way. <clears throat> God is going to, at times, open doors that otherwise would have been frozen shut to you. Because again, the resurrected Lord, who rolled back the stone of His own tomb, an impossibility for men is able to overcome any barriers in your life he wants to in order to accomplish his plan and his purpose with your life. God has a purpose for your life. If you are one of his, he is working in your life to accomplish this purpose and to accomplish this plan. And he's able to overcome any barriers in order to accomplish this. And that ought to encourage us this morning to know that when we're submitting to God and when we're giving Him the control over our lives, that these things that we experience cannot move us. Just like Paul says in the book of Acts. Uh, um, he says there, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. I, I believe it's chapter 20. I didn't write it down, but I believe it's chapter 20. It says, Now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy 
in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, I don't know what's going to happen to me there in Jerusalem. It could be chains. It could be tribulations. But none of these things move me. Whatever I'm, I have to face, I'm going to face it knowing that I'm being taken care of by the one who can do all things. And as I've said many times before, surrendering your life to Christ is not going to solve all of your problems. Anybody that's ever told you that has told you a lie. It's not going to solve all of your problems. In fact, you may encounter more problems and more struggles, new problems, new struggles, when you decide to follow Christ. If you're following the Lord, the devil is going to be angry because he's lost his stronghold on you. But you'll also find that once you really get serious about following Jesus with your life and you really try to make the changes in your life and live the way that He wants you to live and you're living that life of repentance and you're living that life uh, trying to spend time with God in prayer and read the Scriptures and attend church and do all of those things that help us grow, you're going to find that you have a new enemy and it's not the devil. You're going to find that you have another enemy other than the devil, and that is the sin that's still in your own heart. You're now striving against and repenting of that sin in your heart every day. It's a new struggle. But God sees us in our struggle, and He has plenty of grace to supply. He has promised that uh, He will never allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to. To bear. And if you take a legalistic approach to a Christian life, you're going to burn out. After a while, you're going to fail and you're going to give up trying to live holy. Or on the other, the other possibility to that, taking a legalistic approach to the Christian life, other than burning out, you're going to end up becoming so self-righteous that you won't even see your own sin anymore. But when you accept that to live as God would have us to live is not in your own power, it's a very liberating thing, brothers and sisters, to understand that living holy as God has called us is not in our own power. And once we come to that, once we truly accept that, that's when we can truly and wholly depend on the Holy Spirit to help us. The devil and those of the world system have made our failure as Christians as secure as they can. But it's not enough. Just like the tomb was not secure enough to stop Christ, the forces working against us cannot thwart God's plan to conform His children into the image of His Son. That's predestined. When we realize that no one can stop God... And if we realize that we have God on our side, the God who's promised to help us grow into stronger and more faithful Christians, then we should not be discouraged when it gets tough. But we must lean upon the Lord more. As the tougher it gets, the more we lean on God. If you have experienced this, you know it's true. Now this morning, if you've never really started a real relationship with Jesus Christ, you really need to consider how important such a relationship is. Your life's going to end one day. You may be young now, but even if you live to be a hundred years old, your life will one day end on this earth and then you're going to have to face God. But if you haven't had the Lord Jesus in your life, if you haven't been born again, then that condemnation and that sin and that guilt that we talked about that Jesus overcame for sinners, that's not going to be, that victory is not going to benefit you in that day of judgment. 
You'll still be dead in trespasses and sins. You'll still be bearing the guilt and the condemnation of your sin. Because you haven't looked to the one who is able to redeem you and to forgive you of your sins. We can only be assured that we've overcome the world and eternal death if we have believed in Christ and have kept believing in Him to the end. You know, John writes to us there, he says, this is the victory that overcomes the world. It is our faith. Our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith in the Gospel. If you've never had a relationship with Christ, why don't you start calling upon Him? It's very interesting when you look into what it actually means to call upon the name of the Lord. You know, in Romans chapter 10, we're told that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then in Romans in verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And many people today view that as a one-time act. I called upon the name of the Lord. And they're looking back to this one period in time when they called upon the name of the Lord. No, that's not the concept of calling upon the name of the Lord we find in the Scriptures. matter of fact, if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, it says, Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. It's something that you begin to do and you do for the rest of your life. You're calling upon the Lord as your Savior from sin and from death and from hell and as your God to worship Him. You're calling upon Him. You're, you're beginning that lifelong relationship with Him. That's what it means. So if you've never <clears throat> if you've never really had a relationship with God, a real one a genuine one, why don't you start calling upon the Lord? Why don't you begin to read the Scriptures for yourself? Learn more about who He is. Learn more about what Jesus Christ can do in your life. There are many here who would love to sit down and talk with you and to show you what the Lord can do in your life if you'll turn to Him. And if you want Christ in your life, He has assured us that those who come to Him. Those who truly come to Him seeking the salvation of their souls, He will never cast away. He will not turn away. So, it's very important. If you have not really started a real relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to consider how important that is. And then for those of us who have a genuine, genuine relationship with God, perhaps some of us have allowed the circumstances of our lives to make us lukewarm toward God, towards the Christian life. I believe we've all experienced periods where we've grown a little bit cold, a little bit lukewarm. We've grown weary of facing the struggles of this life. We've grown weary of struggling to hang on. It just seems like that's all we're doing. Let's remember who God is. Let's remember that He is on the side of the one who trusts in Him. He's on the side of the one who relies upon Him. And He's able to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Amen. Let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank You, Father, for who You are. That You are infinitely good and merciful. Full of grace and truth. And that You don't turn those away who truly come to You seeking salvation. We ask You, Lord, that You'd help us as we face things in this life, to 
rely upon You, Lord, to help us through these things. We should never try to face difficulties and hardships in our own strength. You never designed it that way. You designed, Father, from the beginning that there would be no pain. But man fell. And now we have to deal with these consequences until you redeem all things once, once again. But Father, help us, Lord, as we seek to live obedient lives to you. Help us to keep struggling, Lord, to repent of our sins and to be faithful, Lord, to the means, to the, to, to, to the church and Make a diligent use of the means of grace. Father, we know that spiritual ruin begins when we neglect the means of grace. Father, may it never be at the case in our lives. Help us, Father, to do what we know we ought to do. And be mindful and reflect and meditate upon the death, the resurrection, and the burial of Christ. Remembering that <clears throat> what's impossible for men is, is possible with you, Lord. So we thank you that, for that. And we trust you, Lord, that you're working what's best in our lives for our good, for your glory, and for your plan. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.